a spontaneous and unrehearsed interview. Welcome to Curiosityness, the podcast where we talk about stuff that you might be curious about. Uh, I just made up that tagline. My name's Travis DeRose. I'm the host. Welcome to episode 53. I got on Jonathan Wilker this episode, and this may sound boring at first glance, but let me tell you, this stuff is so interesting, what Jonathan is doing. Like, you just think adhesives. He's making adhesives, you know, using what mo- what mu- uh, muscles and oysters are doing. Like, who cares? Sounds boring. It's the opposite of boring it's so cool uh i thought this episode would last maybe a half hour we went for like an hour and 20 minutes because it's awesome uh so i think if you just get in there and give it a chance you're really gonna love this it's super interesting interesting jonathan has a great way of explaining things and you know making it fun and graspable and understandable for people who aren't, you know, in chemistry and chemistry majors. Uh, And especially when we get to the uses of how all of his different adhesives can work, like for biomedical stuff and like adhering a metal plate to bone, all this crazy stuff. Adhesives are everywhere. They're in plywood. They're super toxic. So he's also working to, you know, remove the toxicity of those and the carcinogens that, you know, is everywhere because plywood and everything is made out of uh adhesive it's 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 everywhere so this is super important it's crazy i'm gonna stop talking now and let's get to jonathan wilker and boom we're going what's up john hey thanks for having me on yeah of course man stoked to talk to you this is like uh pretty interesting stuff i mean at first i was you know i thanks. I, you know, saw what you're into. I'm like glue, like really, but (laughs) you know, I think it's because all all I was thinking about was like the, the glue aisle at home Depot, you know, but it's like, (laughs) (laughs) but when you really get to it, there's so many, it's like you, you talk about how much glue is used for everything from like manufacturing, you know, cars and plywood and everything. It's, it's It's everywhere all, all around us. Just, just like sort of just turn your head around a room or anywhere you are outside and everything's held together with adhesives yeah yeah it's crazy stuff so yeah <laughs> i mean <laughs> initially it's like okay whatever we'll try it but yeah it's it's pretty exciting when you really get into it it's it's awesome the stuff you're doing cool glad glad, glad you think that <laughs> yeah. i look at these things a little bit differently now uh but yeah it's it's complete integral part of our lives and uh well we'll get into it but there's a lot of uh cool things a lot of new things you can do a lot of problems that the current materials are are causing and yeah there's there's tons we can we can talk about yeah yeah cool so let's get into it i mean let's let's just start with like you and your background and how this all got started so i guess if i want to really get down to it so if i'm like lying down on the couch you know tell me about your childhood kind <laughs> of thing. uh so it things sort of started when i was a kid because my parents would bring me to the ocean a lot and that and that's in um, the new england area and they just sort of developed a, a love for the ocean in me and okay that's fine <laughs> um and then <laughs> then i went to college like you do and i went to graduate school just kind of a thing to do and i, I ended up studying chemistry um not thinking about anything related to, you know, adhesives or whatever, just doing regular chemistry stuff, right. which on its own is, is fascinating. And, and I love that, that kind of thing. But then, uh, as I got a little bit older, I started scuba diving more oh. partly because of, yeah. Cause I got this, you know, appreciation for the ocean and I was fortunate enough to live in, uh, in New England and then, and then in Southern California where you can actually go scuba diving. And uh, as I was diving, and I was, I would see these sea creatures, and but they're they're amazing, right? So they're stuck to the rocks. You can see it on beaches. You can see it on the water. Mm-hmm. And I was kind of curious. Well, gee, how do they do that? How do they stick? Because uh, it's right there in front of you. So surely we know all about this. And so I'll just sort of walk my way over to the library and, and just read about it. And right. Um, of course, people have studied this, and, and actually, uh, some of the papers even go back to Darwin, like literally that Darwin. Oh, he wow. Described how, yeah, yeah. He, he described how, you know, pictures of Peter, how 
barnacles stick themselves oh. onto rocks, or actually more, more of their anatomy. But yeah, yeah, there's there's yeah Darwin work from the 1800s on this, and so people have studied been studying this for a long time. But in terms of you know really the the details and the chemistry and and how do they actually do this? Um, at least back when I started, there was surprisingly little information. There certainly was information people before us for sure, but I was quite surprised at how little is known. And so this was, this was about the time that I was finishing up my postdoc or my education and I was going to come here to Purdue and start my own lab. And I had all these other ideas of things I wanted to do chemistry wise, whatever. But when I, once I realized uh, how little was known in this area and how cool it could be that basically st- understand how biology works, and how you make materials, and then maybe we could use that information to develop new systems with properties you've never had access to before. So basically then I just kind of ditched everything. <laughs> I, I threw away all the plans, <laughs> all the carefully written up plans, and then start and started the lab here uh, to study this. And um, it's been it's been a lot of fun since we do that. I, I can tell you about some of the aspects of it that I think are particularly cool from the biological end, maybe. Then we can get into sort of what you can do with it later. Yeah, yeah, hit me with it. All right, so so I guess one of the one of the first things I think that's interesting is so if you if you go to a beach and let's say you're there like even just let's say on a stormy day or something you go to the water's edge say it's a rocky beach and you try to stand there uh, usually you're going to get knocked around by waves and you're going to get banged up and you're going to get hurt mm-hmm. you know generally just not a not a calm easy place to exist right, right. But then yeah if you look down at your feet what you see is that there are all these sea creatures that are sticking to the rocks, Mm -hmm. right? And they're just, they're sticking there. And, and not only are they there able to stay in place when we people cannot, and and of course that they're doing this by making pieces. Uh, It's not usually suction. It's usually adhesives. Um, There are some bits that do suction, but it's it's mostly adhesives. Uh Um, So not only are they able to stay in place the way a person could not, um, but if you think about adhesives that you buy at the hardware store, they don't work in wet environments. Yeah. Right? And so these animals are able to make adhesives in a rather hostile environment and, and do so in a way that people cannot. So, and there's lots of reasons they do this for their survival. But just before you get to that, just they're there. You see them at the beach. They're doing things that people cannot do. And so right away, you know, you start asking lots of questions. How are they doing? You know, why are they doing this? What mm-hmm. can we do with the technology? So yeah, totally. It, it, yeah, yeah, yeah. So. Yeah, man. No, I love it. I love how it, you know, you're, you're kind of on track. You're doing, you know, you're with, you're with chemistry, but then you see this, you kind of have this inspiration idea and you're like, dang, this is, how the <laughs> hell are they doing this? You know, it's yeah, so yeah. interesting. <laughs> No one's really done it before, so you're like, "Well, this is the opportunity. I got to jump on it and, and do yeah, it." I yeah. love that. It's awesome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's fun. It's, fun. it's and that's actually one of the cool things about science and engineering and, and research in general, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, you you have the ability if you sort of put all the ducks in a row and, and you know, get get proper education, and you got to get a lab and funding and stuff like that. But basically, you can you can work on problems that are super cool like this yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah sweet so so tell me a bit about you know your your lab and your research and in kind of what you guys are doing there right so uh so we've got a lab here at, at purdue we roughly half of what we do is trying to figure out how the animals stick themselves to rocks and how they make their pieces how they function and then roughly half the lab is trying to develop new materials with properties we've not had access to before based on what we learn from the fundamental uh, studies that characterize the adhesives. Oh. Um, yeah. Maybe, maybe, maybe before we get into that, maybe should I say just a few things about why the animals make the adhesives that they do? Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah. Please do. Because cause it's, it's uh, I think if you put it in context, it, I, I think at least it's a little bit more interesting. So, so, like I said, so imagine if you're you're at the beach and you're trying to stay in place, but you're getting knocked around by the waves. So that's damaging, right? So one reason that the animals make these adhesives is just you know stay in place and not get not get damaged and hurt mm-hmm. and, and killed and stuff like that. Um, another thing is when you when you 
look at them, what you'll notice. So, so the, the, the animals we study here in our lab, we grow mussels, we grow oysters, uh, but there's also, you know, lots of other sea creatures that are making use of, so starfish and barnacles are a classic example, and sea grasses, um, sea urchins, anemone, wow. all, all, all sorts of creatures, um, <clears throat> corals, uh, giant clams. There's tons of things. Um, but what you'll notice, especially if you think about like barnacles, mussels, oysters, that sort of thing, you never really see one of them alone on a rock. You yeah. always see them clustered in the community together, right? Right. And so what, yeah. And so what they're doing is they're not actually just sticking to the surfaces. And in many cases, they're also sticking to their neighbors. And so what they do is they build a community and these communities accomplish several things. And so one is that imagine if you're, let's say a muscle and you're in the middle of a cluster and a big wave comes along, well, the, you're not going to be subjected to as much hydrodynamic force because it's spread out over the whole community rather than if you were out there alone taking the brunt of a wave. Right. Example, right. Mm -hmm. So they, they cluster together to, to help, you know, just not get knocked around. And another reason they do this is, um, uh, it's safety from predator, right? And so if you have like a seagull that wants to come and pick you up and eat you, well, it's a lot more difficult for the seagull to do that uh, if you're stuck to your knee, you're stuck to the surface. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, and what you'll notice is if you, if you go uh, look at a bed of mussels and, um, you know, down in Southern California where you are, there's a really good place to distance, uh, look at the beach actually. But anyways, if you, but you can see this in Maine, all over New England, tons of the Northwest, tons of areas. If you see a bed of mussels and you want to say, oh, well, you know, how strong is it? He says, I'll try to pull one off of a rock and see. The first thing you'll notice is that when you, when you, put, when you try to pick it up, they're clustered together so tightly that you can only touch sort of the, the upper half of the animal. You, you cannot get your fingers around to the bottom of the shell to then be able to yank it out. Right. Okay. Right. So this is done on purpose, but, but, but the way they get together closely like that is, is by using it. So, um, those are some reasons that they do this, but then there's another interesting reason why they, they make these communities and stick together and that's for reproductive efficiency. And so if most of these animals, we, we can talk about exceptions in a minute, but, uh, most of these animals reproduce by spawning. And so they'll eject, uh, you know, they're, they're spawned into the surrounding water. And if they're all close to each other, well, then the efficiency of their reproduction is going to be a lot higher versus if there's one on this rock and one on the next rock. Right. Next rock, right? Yeah. Makes sense. So, yeah. I mean, sort of like, you know, it's easier to find, if you're a person, it's easier to find somebody, I don't know, a crowded bar or a city versus <laughs> out in the middle of a cornfield or something. Right. It's right. Yeah. Pretty much, pretty much the same story. They, <laughs> they have the same dating woe, dating woes that, that would be like. <laughs> yes, exactly. It's tough for them too. Yeah. Um, the, the one exception, and I mentioned this at, at my own peril, knowing that this is probably going to be the only thing that anyone's going to remember in this whole podcast. But <laughs> <laughs> so, so most of the animals I mentioned, like the mussels, oysters, they're, they're bivalves, mollusks. Uh, barnacles are actually crustaceans, and um, do, you, do you want to know how a barnacle reproduces? <laughs> oh yes, yes please. <laughs> so, so they're they're crustaceans, so they're they're different, um, and so because they're cemented in place and they cannot move, um, uh, how do I say this politely? So the the. <laughs> The one, it, it, okay, so it's it's time for Mr. and Mrs. Barnacle to, to have kids, right? Right. So what Mr. Barnacle does is he has to have his penis reach over uh, far enough to to find uh, a partner, <laughs> and, and so 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 it ends up being very long. And so it actually turns out that as a function of body size, uh, barnacles have the uh, longest penis in the animal kingdom wow impressive yeah I good know, for I the know. barnacle yeah. I know. yeah yeah it's all because of the glue yeah <laughs> wow I had no idea yeah, yeah. Uh, gee honey what'd you hear on the radio today well let me tell you <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's a good so, fact um, that's a good trivia fact to have in your back pocket 
Yeah, 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 yeah. It, it, it does well at cocktail parties. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so um, there's that. Um, and then, and actually, another uh, another interesting thing I'll mention uh, is one of the animals who studies oysters, and it turns out that oysters are um, arguably they provide one of the most dominant influences on how healthy any coastal marine ecosystem is. And so uh, if you think about, you know, a lot, you'll see this again a lot in the Pacific Northwest or, or the East Coast or the Gulf Coast. Uh, you can have just literally miles and miles of oysters all cemented to each other, make reefs. Mm -hmm. And you don't see a lot of this anymore because because 98% or so of, of the native reefs are gone. But anyways, they, they make these reef structures and what those reefs do is they hold sand and dirt in place and because you'll have billions of muscle potentially billions of muscles in a, in a location they can um they're filter feeders right so they they get all their nutrients by filtering water through and capturing the nutrient filter but in doing so they're also filtering a lot of sand and silt and stuff from the water so they they clean the water um and then you can imagine if a storm surge comes in, a big hurricane or something, a big storm surge. And if the storm surge first has to go through, you know, 10, 20 miles of, of dense, dense oyster reefs, it's not going to be as uh, bad when it hits the coast. And so they provide a lot of uh, protection. Right. Coast. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's pretty interesting. So like, if you think of um, Hurricane Katrina or New Orleans or Hurricane Sandy around New Jersey, New York, uh -huh. um, those, those areas used to have a lot of oyster reefs and so what i've heard is it's maybe 60 miles of oyster reefs that used to be in the gulf wow between the water and katrina and uh, between and between the water and new orleans mm -hmm. and so katrina came in there sandy came to the northeast um the, the damage was a lot more extensive because the oyster reefs were not there wow yeah yeah so and what's i mean what happened to the oyster reefs um, fishing and pollution and I disease. See. Yeah. Yeah. So <clears throat> the, the stocks started being taken out a lot mid to late 1800s. And so they say that if you go back 150 years ago, um, you know, the Chesapeake Bay, which is one of the most studied, um, bay systems, uh, the, the equivalent volume of water from all the, um, from all the oysters filtering it, they would filter the equivalent volume of the entire bay every two or three days. Whoa. And now that's what it used to be. Yeah. Every two or three days. And now it's, it takes like two or three months oh, to man. do that. Yeah, yeah. 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 And so actually, if you think about coastal waters in most places, um, I was about to say the U S but it's kind of in the world. Um, a lot of times you think of things being, Oh, the water's all murky there, dirty, that kind of thing. But uh -huh. A lot of that is because the oysters aren't there anymore, that wow. they used to be. So 150 years ago, it used to be crystal clear water. But Interesting. Then, yeah, 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 yeah. And so if you take away the system that's filtering the water, but also in addition to that, if you take away a system that is holding the sand and dirt in place, it is there. Right. Well, this okay. Is, this is what you got. Yeah. Wow. That's crazy. That I never knew that, but that makes total yeah. sense. <laughs> Isn't it interesting? Yeah. So, I mean, I know this probably isn't your area of expertise, but are, is work being done to kind of try to restore um, those oysters? Yeah. So that's actually a good question. Um, a little bit, but as far as I know, not tons. Like, that there's not really a, na a national program to do this, and it's more state by state, and, and the budgets are not very high for this kind of thing. I think I saw in some some uh 10 years ago or something that i think north carolina spent maybe five hundred seven thousand dollars a year on this so it's it's not yeah. a lot of money mm -hmm. but but it's interesting that i mean i guess one let me mention one positive thing so you can think it's all you know woe and gloom environment degrading stuff like that um but so you can sleep at night still <laughs> uh, it, it's one of these things where a small amount of money and effort can have a really big impact because what ends up happening is uh, if you want to reintroduce oysters, uh, 
if you announce a, a, a reef restoration program, people come out of the woodwork to volunteer their time. Oh. Uh, yeah. And so usually in, in you know a lot of projects, labor is the biggest cost. And so you can get uh, volunteer labor. You can get um, equipment and facilities, you know, used at a pretty low rate. So it's one of these things that with a very, relatively speaking, for, with a low input of resources, you can get a very major um, impact in terms of environmental restoration. Wow, cool. And, and yeah, and it's actually one of these things that you can just see with your eyes. You yeah. Know? I mean, one of the problems that people have with climate change and, and CO2 and stuff, so you can't really see it. It's a very abstract concept in, mm -hmm. in some regards, whereas in this case, you could put stuff in the water and it'll take a while, but you know, you come back some years later, you could actually see it there. Yeah, I could see it almost, you know, it would have like a commercial benefit too, where that's a big, mm -hmm. you know, advertising selling point where mm -hmm. we have mm -hmm. super mm -hmm. clean, crystal clear waters, you know? Yep. 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 Yeah. Yeah. So I know uh, the people, so a lot of the oysters that you would eat are farmed. And so, yeah, this is one of the things I've heard um, oyster farmers try and, and sort of put as a selling point. Like, hey, look, actually what we're doing, you should eat more oysters because the more oysters we have, actually the cleaner the environment's going to get. Right. It's one of the few foods that actually has a remediative effect in growing. Man, that's awesome. <laughs> right. A, a lot of things you're trying to sort of just minimize the impact, whereas this is one of the few things you can do to actually enhance uh, <laughs> what we have. Right. Yeah. yeah. I love that house. Just nature has created its own, you know, filtration, yeah. you yeah. know, process. Yeah, it's so cool. It is. It's, it's, it's really cool. Yeah. I, I agree completely. It's, it's very cool. <laughs> and then, so, so I guess just to bring it back a little bit, these, you know, so like mussels and oysters, they're just kind mm -hmm. of, they kind of secrete this, you know, these chemical compounds or whatever it is that, yeah. that yeah. is the, you know, adhesive. Yeah. So they do at the simplest level, um, what we're trying to do is figure out what those things are, <laughs> right? <laughs> which sounds really easy. Like, oh, just get them, yeah. just milk, them milk the animals and, you know, put it in some fancy instrument and, and tell me what it is. Yeah. Um, it's, that's the general idea. It's obviously more difficult than that. And we've been working on this for 20 years, I guess. <laughs> uh, so, and other labs have been, are working on this too. Of course, it's not just us. Right. Uh, so yeah. And, and, one of the things we have been trying to figure out is what's the difference between all these different animals and what they make. And there are some themes that seem to be popping up, um, but they're they're also turning out system to have some individual kind of characteristics. So the the two that we study, the mussels and the oysters, chemically at least, they sort of make, at least the way I look, I think about it, um, bookends chemically in that uh, the muscle adhesive is pretty much all organic. So it's, it's almost all protein based. Uh, so proteins are sort of the machinery that all life operates on. Mm -hmm. uh, like, yeah. Your hair and everything just is made from protein. It's all you know, the enzymes, the, the gosh, like everything. <laughs> <laughs> not, not, not really everything, no, because there's other materials. But, but sort of proteins are sort of like one of the like the most important thing to to make a living organism exist. Okay. Um, arguably, then again, I'm sure if you talked to a polysaccharide person or a lipid person, they'd probably say the same. But anyways, <laughs> <laughs> I guess it depends who you ask. But, but basically, proteins are, are are key, and proteins are organic, right? And and any plastic or material that you see is organic. And if you go to the hardware store, um, all the adhesives are organic. They're either polymers or they're uh, what we call monomers, small molecules that are going to become long molecules, that are essentially polymers or plastic. Um, however, what we're finding with the oysters is that what they have is more inorganic. Um, the main component of their adhesive is uh, calcium carbonate, which is chalk or, or seashells, basically. Mm -hmm. uh, and, if, and chalk is not... An adhesive, obviously, um, but they add some components. And it's, it's mostly chalk, but then they add in some co organic components to make it adhesive. But anyways, chemically, they're they're really quite distinct. The muscle adhesive is all organic or organic in water, um, and then the 
oysters more we call it a cement really the oysters more of a, like a hard almost more like a concrete kind of thing okay um, yeah that's, that's a very very broad level of course there's lots of subtleties and differences and we're kind of trying to figure out what all of those subtleties and differences are mm-hmm. um but so can you yeah get, they're pretty different can you kind of help me with the understanding the difference between organic and inorganic so yeah so like inorganic is like a rock okay <laughs> right inorganic could be a rock or or a brick or uh yeah, stuff like that. Whereas organic would be some usually something that's living or or made from organic materials. So, you know, almost everything in your body is organic. Okay. Um, with the exception of your bones and your teeth, that those are going to be more inorganic, although they have some organic components in them. Okay, uh, I see. Yeah. Is that like kind of meaning it's like an organ? Like an organism think- or something? Is that kind of how it relates or am I off base there? That's probably the origin of the word. I don't actually know. Um, yeah, but it's more. Um, so, like, like oh, example. So, like, like fossil fuels. That's that's organic. Uh, that's used to make plastics. Those are organic. Think think of like really really hard stuff that's inorganic. So yeah, stones okay. and cement and bricks and chalk and uh, drywall is is an inorganic thing. And, you know. Um, Versus versus wood would be organic. Okay. Uh, yeah, plastics. Uh, yeah, okay. something like that. No, that kind of. I think I'm I'm getting it. That that makes sense. So you're finding that oysters have are making stuff that's more inorganic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. Which we didn't expect because it's not the inorganic things don't tend to be sticky. Right? Yeah, right. You kind of think of you know adhesive as like kind of a gooey substance or something. Yeah. And usually organic, yeah. Right. So that's interesting. Yeah, wow. So, yeah, like how are, are you kind of able to take that finding that they're using that inorganic stuff as adhesive and, and turn that into something that we can use potentially? Yeah, yeah. So that that's exactly what we're doing, right? So, so um, okay, so what you can do <laughs> if you're, really motivated you you can actually extract the adhesives from the animals and that's what we do in order to figure out what it is and characterize it and stuff um but if you if you do that you don't get a lot of material right so you'll get you know milligrams so you know enough to see but not enough to really start gluing things together or do anything so if you want to make an adhesive even if it's for a really high-end expensive application like biomedical or something like that Uh you're still never going to get enough material from the animals to do it so we have to learn lessons from the animals but then adapt those to systems that we can make synthetically okay yeah and so the approach we've taken and and here too there, there are other labs that are doing this um but the approach we take is uh so the molecules, or at least as much as we know at this point, but I think there's, we know only a tiny, tiny percentage of what these animals are really doing. But as far as what we know right now, one of the key components seem to be proteins, which are organic, and they're they're very long molecules. Um, they're they're very very long, and they what the animals are doing is they're putting this specific, um group in there that gives rise to adhesion and i can get into all the chemistry if you want but it's probably be not best <laughs> to get too detailed <laughs> into this but let's just say it's a really really long molecule and it's got in the middle of it t- distributed throughout there are some groups in it that specifically give rise to sort of cross-linking and, and adhesion chemistry but you can't you can't synthesize that on a large scale you can't extract it from the animal on a large scale so what we're doing is we're taking other long molecules that you can get on large scales and so we start with essentially plastics like polystyrene so you know like a like a white cap to a coffee cup that's polystyrene or or, or packing peanuts are usually styrofoam mm-hmm. right? um we we don't start with that because we have to make it but basically what we'll do is we'll 
essentially what it is is we'll, we'll have something that's a really, really long molecule like a polystyrene. But then every now and then in, in that long molecule, we'll add in some of the chemical groups that we see in the proteins that give rise to adhesion. Okay. Okay. So, okay. So far. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm on board. Yeah, okay. Okay. You're on board. Okay. Good. Good. Yep. So, so, and then also, and I'm just using polystyrene as an example, cause it's sort of this, the simplest system we made, and, but it, but it works, it seems to work really well. So polystyrene, like a coffee well, actually, a coffee cup could be styrofoam, like a styrofoam coffee cup or, or a cap mm-hmm. on a paper coffee cup. That's, that's polystyrene. But that's not an adhesive, right? It right. doesn't stick to anything. But we can, by, doing, by making this chemical change, um, we have been able to make um, these systems that can bond uh, more strongly than superglue. Wow. Actually. Yeah. And that's dry. Uh, so that's good. I mean, a dry substrate is just sort of like out on the bench top or something. So that's fun. Um, what we've also been able to do is get these systems to set underwater yeah. and we can actually make strong bonds underwater. And that's starting to be kind of rare, right? Because most adhesives don't work at all underwater. Usually water gets in the way of adhesion because if you try to put an adhesive down, um, underwater so if it's if it's a elmer's glue well that's a suspension in water and so it's not going to cure until it dries out and it's down the water mm-hmm. or at the other end super glue actually uses water in the air to start the curing process but when you oh. do it underwater there's so much uh water around that it cures too quickly like as soon as it comes out of the tube it doesn't stick to anything. okay um, interesting yeah 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 and then most so and, and then other issues are the the, the, the if you have an adhesive Either the water will get the adhesive will interact with the water instead of your surface, or the surface is covered with water, and so the adhesive never really gets down there. So, so sticking in a wet environment is a very difficult thing. And so, if we bring this back to the sea creatures, they've obviously figured out how to do this. Most man-made adhesives don't, but if we make a biomimetic version of what we see from the animals, then we can get underwater. Okay. So I think I okay. I think I kind of understand your your process is where you, you know, you're looking at the animals and what they have, what they've produced and, you know, looking at the molecules and then you're trying to find a similar molecule that we can kind of produce on a large scale yep. or, or make. It. And that's, yeah. you're, you're just trying to replicate it essentially. Yeah. I mean, we're not trying to replicate it exactly for several reasons. So <clears throat> one reason is that it, if you make the same thing, it'd be really difficult and you couldn't do it on a large scale but another is that the animals are trying to they're trying to stick a shellfish to a rock and we're not typically interested in sticking <laughs> a shellfish to a rock right because it's sort of been done so yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but but if you want to make uh let's say a biomedical adhesive that works in a wet environment like within the body or if you're trying to make uh, uh, an adhesive for, you know, packaging or something to make it more, to make it degradable. Or if you want to make something that's mechanically, it's adhesive, but it's mechanically a little bit flexible, so it can withstand a lot of vibration. So if it's for you know, automotive or aerospace or something like that. So basically what we do is we start with what we know from the animals. And then in making these synthetic versions, for each new system that we make, we think about a property that we'd like to have okay right so we're not so we use the information from the animals but we're not necessarily trying to exactly replicate it because if i want to um i don't know like 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 your your phone or your laptop or something you can't use you can't really recycle the components very easily because everything glued together right so if i wanted to make an adhesive that glued well but then could come apart later well then i might make that or if i wanted to say oh i want to replace you know the toxic formaldehyde in plywood or make a make packaging that could be composted which you can't you can't compost a cardboard box now because the the paper you can but it's all held together with adhesives right oh yeah yeah you know (laughs) (laughs) so if i said okay well i'll I'll use the adhesion chemistry i see in the shellfish but then i want to use a bio-based um sort of backbone for the system then i'll put that in so it depends it depends what we're trying to do 
man, that's so cool. So you're able to kind of to use this to start with and then go in and, and change stuff up depending on the use. Like if you want yep. it to be recyclable or are you able to change things like the curing time and stuff like that yep. even? Yep. yep. Wow. Yep. Man, it's crazy yeah. that you have that much, that you're able to have that much control and, and work through all these different things. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's not, that part's not too difficult. The, what, what you end up with though is uh, so many variables that it's, sometimes difficult to get a handle on everything because if, you know it's one polymer system versus another or if the chains are the molecules are you know this long or that long or if they have you know a little bit of the adhesion chemistry in them or a lot or if you add a filler or if you add a cross linker to make it cure more quickly or less quickly high temperature <laughs> low temperature do you you know what solvent do you put it in to make it flow what, what concentration do you do so you end up with just so many variables yeah that geez. um so on one hand you have tons of flexibility on the other hand there are a zillion knobs to sort of turn back and forth and figure out what to do yeah i could be, yeah that just sounds overwhelming but it is cool on the one hand where you may be able to find or create the perfect adhesive for you know a specific use i guess but that just sounds like a ton of stuff to think about yeah, I mean, so like in in one case, one of the systems that we've got that we've spent the most time with, um, we've sort of figured out. Okay, here's the version of this polymer that has the highest adhesion, but if you want to use it for cosmetics, you could you could start with the same polymer, but you might want to use it for cosmetics, which are there's some interesting applications there. Maybe we should talk about, uh, but or if you want to use it for construction, or you want to use it for biomedical, or you want to use it for electronics in each of those cases you're gonna formulate it differently right so if it's cosmetics it's got to be you know roughly room or body temperature and you want it to set quickly if it's you know for assembly electronics well you know they're already pushing things through with the gun or something and they you might want it to be a couple hundred degrees mm -hmm. and you have longer to, to let it cure so so yeah you could even start with the same base molecule but it but you're gonna have to twiddle it around and and do different things with it okay yeah yeah interesting okay i i think i'm understanding this it makes sense <laughs> good good yeah good. yeah no you're doing a great job of explaining it. i love this so can okay we... good good yeah good. No. yeah if, it, if it's ever too complicated just tell me i'll dial it back no no this is great um because yeah i know it's it can be difficult when you're you know i'm just want the broad overview understanding of it and some details, but you work in this every day. So I understand that it's, yeah, it's yeah, a little close to it. Yeah. 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 Um, so yeah. Can we talk about, or oh, I guess let's first talk about, I think you mentioned your kind of your lab, what that looks like maybe. And then you also mentioned yeah. you had like a, a pet lobster or a pet crab story to share, right? Oh, <laughs> yeah. There's, there's a few. Yeah. So, um, so our lab, uh, we have one room. It's sort of our aquarium room where we've got, I don't know, three, maybe 500 gallons of salt water sloshing around. <laughs> uh, where, so we actually, in that tank, we grow mussels and we sort of have it divided out into regions. So one is uh, a holding tank, like literally, it's where we hold the animals in a tank <laughs> when, when we want them to just sit there. If, if, we, if we induce them to make adhesive, it tires them out and they only can do it a few times before they stop producing adhesive so uh -huh. we let them rest in that one tank but then we have another it's all one system when you when you do marine when you grow marine organisms like this the larger the volume you can get the easier it is to sort of buffer and control the chemistry in the water to keep the animals healthy so so we use very very large volumes but um if we want them to make adhesive we put them in another area of the same <clears throat> the same system and uh, there we have a, a wave system. And I should say, okay, so we, we, we have the whole thing set up so that it simulates uh, Maine in February. Because this, this is, they really like it when it's cold. They don't like it when it gets warm. Okay. Uh, that's, when they re, that's when they reproduce. Actually, when the water temperature goes up in the summer, uh, you know how people say don't eat shellfish in the summer? Okay. Right? Maybe you haven't, but okay. I haven't it heard that. Used to, it used to be a thing. Yeah, yeah I okay. believe it used to be yeah. a thing. Okay, yeah, yeah. So people, like when I was a kid, people would say, don't eat shellfish in any month that 
uh, doesn't have an R in it, right? Because it's the summer. The, the reason nowadays you can get stuff that's pretty much in good shape year round, but but back when I was a kid, you couldn't. And the reason is the the when the water temperature goes up, that's their signal to reproduce, and so they spawn and they reproduce and they they expend a lot of their metabolic energy doing this, and they get weaker, mm. and so they're they're unhealthy at those times. So we don't want that. So what we do is we make it the coldest conditions they would see. So basically February, like Maine, and we have the lights in the room cycled. So that it's like a, a day in February and Maine. Oh, cool. And yeah. And then we have a surge system to make waves. <laughs> it's because when, when they, we, we, we debate whether or not this is actually accurate and useful in the lab, but uh, essentially if you put them in a more turbulent environment, the idea is that they'll make more adhesive to, to stay in place better versus if they're just in water, that's not moving around a lot. Right. So, so we have a system that it's, it's a siphon system, but in essence, it's sort of like a toilet that basically we have a, a, they're, they're in one tank and then there's a, another tank next to it that we pump water into. And when it fills up and it hits a certain level and it opens up and it all sloshes down and creates a bunch of turbulence, stuff like that one that fills up again and it does this in cycles. Okay. So that's what we do with the mussels and the oysters. The oysters are, they're a little bit more sedate. and They're sometimes in estuary and waters, which aren't as, as turbulent. So, so for, we have them in separate tanks that we don't have the surge system in there. But so we have the aquarium room. And so even though we're in, Indi in Indiana, uh, the, the lab, Smells like the ocean. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then, and then, in the other half of the lab, it looks like a like a tr pretty traditional Wigan chemistry, biochemistry kind of lab. So we have things, you know, glassware, and we do synthesis. And we make things, and there's some instruments we have to analyze things. Some of them are chemical instruments or biochemical instruments, and then some of them. Then we also have a, a materials testing machine. So when we make new adhesives, our our functional assay is to glue things together. So basically we'll take two pieces of aluminum or two pieces of wood or two pieces of Teflon or something like that, apply our adhesive there and we'll glue them together, cure it under various conditions and pull them apart and measure the force that's withstood by, by the joints. Okay. And then, and we also compare it to commercial adhesive. So if I say, Oh, it's stronger than super glue, it's because we also measured super glue right, right. right next to it under the same conditions. Makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. That's, that sounds awesome. Um, yeah. So can you hit me with the, the lobster story? The lobster, oh, great. So, okay. So you know how I said, <clears throat> actually, there's a lobster story and there's a crab story. If okay. You, if you want, like, let's, let's do them both. Shellfish, shellfish in Indiana stories. <laughs> <laughs> Those are my favorite kind of stories. <laughs> Coincidentally, they're mine too. <laughs> so, so, um, so one day I'm in the, in the airport in Boston and I was collecting some mussels and visiting family and that kind of thing. And in the airport, you can buy lobsters to eat. Okay. And right at the airport. So you can you know, bring them home with you. I'm like, oh, great. You know what? I'm going to get a lobster for the lab. I'm going to have a pet. Yeah. <laughs> I'm have a pet lobster. So I bring, I bring the lobster back and we, we, we put them in the tank with the mussels, but you have to separate them because you don't want them to eat the mussels. Right. So, um, we, we built a little enclosure and, and lobsters like to have, caves to hide in and so we, we this is in a tank of chilled salt water we built this little cave out of flagstone stuff like that and you know we he would live in there and he would occasionally come out um the the students named him butter <laughs> uh and and uh so what we would do is we, we would buy uh frozen dead shrimp to give them because they're they're they eat just you know junk on the on the floor. So we gave him that. He's very very well fed. The best best fed lobster in Indiana. <laughs> and uh, and we had him caged off from the rest of the animals. So so that he had his spot. The mussels had their spot. Stuff like that. And then he grew for like five years. I think he did did pretty well. Wow. Okay. And yeah, he grew and grew and grew. He was getting to be pretty big and pretty fat. And then somehow I don't know. We came in the lab one day. And he broke through the cage and he ate all the mussels. Oh, man. It was hundreds of them <laughs> gone. And then he went back in his cave and he didn't come out for two weeks. 
and he he was in a food coma, but <laughs> I'm pretty sure he knew what he did because he wouldn't make eye contact with us. <laughs> <laughs> you are. Oh no, he was ashamed. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that is the end of the pet lobster story. <laughs> yeah, I mean that's we just have, that's like just staring them. through the uh, through the window looking at a, a you know golden corral for five years. You know, you're going to figure out a way to get there <laughs> eventually. <laughs> eventually, yeah, yeah, yeah. So that that happened. Yeah, the the crab story. So so once I was in uh, Maine collecting mussels. Sometimes we get them from from fishermen and seafood suppliers. And uh, I've, in the past, I've also gone and, and got collected them myself. And uh, I collected a bunch and I put them in some coolers and brought them back. And so th- this was, these were from Maine and uh, actually some from New Hampshire. And we brought them back. And what happened is when you, you know, you have to wait for low tide to get them. And when I was there, it was dark. And so, you know, flashlight between my chin in my chest and I'm getting sprayed with salt water and freezing my hands are numb and whatever so you just you, you get what you can you put them in the coolers you bring them back and then what you'll find out after you're cleaning them out and you're you have them in the tank here is that other there's a few other sea creatures sort of tag along for the ride and we got uh there were these crabs that came along with them and they were really really tiny like like Quarter inch? No, not they weren't quarter. I mean, eighth of an inch at the biggest. And, they, and I didn't know this until then. Um, when crabs are that tiny, they're transparent. Oh, you can see right through them. Anyways, they're they're there, and we we would feed the lobster, or feed the uh, mussels, and we put other food in the tank, stuff like that. And they grew and they grew. And this lobster or this uh, crab got to be about like three or four inches across. Oh. Got to be pretty substantial. Okay, fine. And then, clearly desperate to get back to Maine, uh, crawled up out of the tank. I don't know how this happened. And so he crawled up out of the tank, down onto the floor, uh, went out of the room, took a turn, and then started going down the little hallway that we have that then goes into the big hallway <laughs> of, of the building. It was crazy how it, how it was able to do this, and it knew exactly <laughs> exactly where to go towards I don't know towards the sunlight or something. Right. So uh, we picked it up and we put it back in. Okay. And and then a couple of weeks later, we didn't hear about this until it was too late. But it did it again. And apparently, what happened was I went up, took the same route, got out of the tank, went down the floor, turned the corner, went out into the main hall, went down the main hall of the building. And I guess uh, we we used to have an assistant uh, for the lab that worked down the hall, and it saw her and she saw the crab, and it put its claws up and started snapping at her. And, what? and she was from Indiana. She started. She had no idea what it was. She started screaming, <laughs> <laughs> and she ran the other way. And she she ran one way, and and the crab went the other way. And and it kept going and going. And then it went. We have a bridge to the next building, and it went over to the next building wow and then i went into the stairwell and it started going downstairs <laughs> <laughs> and then uh it, i guess it was the change between classes and there was a lot of foot traffic and people didn't see it and, and oh. so they stopped, stepped on it and so somebody then came they, they kind of knew where it probably came from and they, they someone brought to our lab a squished flat crab oh practice. man <laughs> That was the end of the crab. Wow, that was the end of the crab. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah, like the yeah. like a real life, uh, you know, Finding Nemo escaping from the <laughs> dentist scene. You know? Yeah, exactly. Except for it didn't end quite. <laughs> it's not the same uh, Disney no. ending. Yeah. No, it's not, same, it's not the same Disney ending for the <laughs> animals that end up here. Yeah, I'm sorry to say. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, that's fun. That's awesome. I yeah. love stories like that. That just happened. Okay, good, these, good, good. these facilities. That's cool. <laughs> Cool. So let's jump back in. Um, let's talk about some of the like, you know, uses, the potential uses and sure. and things that you guys are developing maybe. And like, I know the biomedical stuff is super interesting. That sounds really cool. Yeah. So I, yeah, I, I think it's, I also think it's really cool. So what, okay. Think about what happens if you get injured or you have to have some surgery. Uh, how do we put you back together? So sutures, staples, screws, right? And these things are horrific. Mm-hmm. I, I like to say that they seem like they were developed in a medieval torture chamber, right? Yeah, really. 
Let, put, let's you know drill holes in people and <laughs> tie them up and pull them back. You know, pull it all back together. It just sounds horrible, right? Right. But it's it's the best thing that we have right now, and and so sutures are bad because you're you're poking holes in healthy tissue and and you pulling it, and then when you put in the sutures in and you tie them together, uh, there's, you're concentrating all these mechanical stresses, and sutures also are sites where you can actually um, create a lot of infections. So those are bad. Uh, if you've ever seen an X-ray of of anyone, excuse me, of anyone that's had a plate put in um, to support pieces of bone or healing, there, if you if you look at the pictures of, you have to you know put screws in on the plate to the bone. If you look at these X-rays, it's crazy how much healthy bone you have to drill out just to hold the plate Oof, in there. Yeah. Right. And then staples, like, yeah, who wants to go get staples, right? So, you know, if we could use adhesives, well, that would be arguably that you'd have much better patient outcomes, right? You know, less mm-hmm. pain, maybe maybe actually a lot less scarring. So this is, plastic surgery is even one place that, that could be there, but it, beyond just basic reconnection of tissue. Um, so we'd be a lot better off if we could use adhesives, but... If you think about it at the very base level, there's sort of three things you need to use an adhesive in a biomedical context, right? So it's got to set wet, which most adhesives don't. It's got to make a strong bond, and there too, in this wet, in wet environments, that doesn't usually work very well. And it's got to be non-toxic. Mm-hmm. And so that trio of properties has never been achieved with anything yet. So you can get two pretty easily right so super glue it can set wet if you do it right and it can make a really strong bond but it's toxic right or there's a there's a commercial uh surgical sealant that's available and it's essentially a blood clot and so it's it's biocompatible so it's, it's not toxic and it works in water or in the body uh but the bonds are really, really weak. So okay. hitting all three of these, so strong bond, non-toxic, and and um, actually working in a wet environment, that's never been done before. So obviously that's a that's a big goal of ours. And we're working on that. It, it, even if you hit all three of those things, there are then requirements that surgeons really want as well. So they want it to you know, set in a, or cure in a time frame compatible with the surgery. So they don't want a 24 hour cure or something. Oh, right, right yeah. <laughs> right, and then... Um, they usually want it to be. Uh, you, you want to. You want to have a similar modulus to that of the tissue around it. So modulus is sort of like a hardness or stiffness measurement. So if you have bone on either side, you want your adhesive to be hard like the bone, stiff like the bone. I should say. If you want, you know, if you're doing skin or some soft tissue that's flexible, you might want your adhesive to be flexible. Uh, another thing that people get picky about is they very often will want an adhesive, not just any adhesive to stick, but they would might eventually want the adhesive to uh, degrade and let the body body's healing process take over and replace the adhesive after a while. Oh, okay. So, yeah, so that these are some of the big things in biomedical, and we're obviously working on this. We've got some progress that I think is pretty exciting, um, but we haven't. I'm not going to say, well, all right, we solved that problem. No. <laughs> Easy, done. <laughs> no way. Right. Uh, yeah. And like, like, like what we talked about earlier, different applications in the body, even if you have the same base adhesive system, you might end up having to formulate it very differently, right? Because what you would need to connect, you know, like fragile intestinal tissue and what you might need to connect bone are going to be very different things. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So it's, it, it's it this one's really complicated <laughs> yeah i can imagine it's really complicated man but that's cool so you, do you feel like i mean do you feel like you're making good progress with this and that this yeah, is yeah. definitely possible to have some of this stuff yeah i i, I think it's a solvable problem yeah. uh yeah, we're making progress, uh, you know, not as quickly as I'd like, but then nothing ever goes as quickly as you want it to, right? Right. Um, but yeah, yeah. I mean, we can stick together bone and we can stick together like wet pig skin and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Um, actually, if, if you want stories, so it's the, the, the very first experiment we ever did with, uh, with,
with bone. So this is really, literally the first thing we ever did years ago. <clears throat> I thought, well, I don't know. We didn't have access to bone. And I, I told that we had this undergrad, uh, Robert, and I said, just like go to the pet store, like buy a dog bone, <laughs> literally just right. bleach bone and um, cut it up into pieces and and use one of our polymers and glue it back together. And this was going to be configured in a way that's not at all surgically relevant. It's obviously a bleached bone, so it's not you know biomedically suitable or relevant or whatever. But just a quick, quick test just to see if we can do anything. Mm-hmm. And we, we we did it in a way that we normally bond together structural materials like metals and plastics and stuff like that. So I said, just I said, just try it. We've never done anything like this before. Just just go and try it. You know, okay. So so he goes away and I don't see him for a week. I don't see him for two weeks. What's going on? I don't see him for three weeks. And and finally I found him, like, Robert, what's going on? You know, you you're gonna try this. I haven't heard anything. And he's like, Yeah, well, man, he goes, Yeah, I'm really sorry. He says, So I got the bone and I cut it up. And then I glued it back together, and then uh, every time I try to pull it apart, the bone shatters, and the adhesive joint stays intact. So I'm really sorry. I don't have any data. <laughs> I can't tell you how strong it is. I don't, I don't have any data. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm like, ah, that's awesome. Wow, yeah. <laughs> like, like if the bone's breaking before the adhesive joint, I'm happy. I don't care. Yeah, really, that's good. Need numbers. Good stuff. That's a good sign. Yeah. 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 No, so it's, it, <laughs> it turns out it's, when you go to real bones, it's much more difficult. So, so if we'll, take, we'll cut up some um like bovine femur or something like that and then when you do that then you you can put the adhesive there but then fats and oils and stuff are coming out of the bone and they're getting between your adhesive and the actual inorganic substrate and there you know there are a lot of complications you needed to set in certain time frames and that kind of thing so it's it's really difficult and i'm not saying we've solved the problem but uh we're working on it and we've had some progress and mm-hmm. it's it's yeah another aspect of this whole research area that I think is, is pretty cool. Yeah. So is, I feel like I had a friend who got just kind of a small cut, like around their eye and they use some sort of glue to kind of just put it together. Yeah. Is that stuff kind of being used in a small way? A little way? bit. Okay. Yeah. In a small way, it's, <clears throat> it's not used that much, but it, it is a little bit. Um, and there are some sealants that are used inside the body, so you might get something sutured up, and then they might add a sealant to sort of um, help along the basically letting fluid flow. You know, not not allowing fluid flow there. And yeah, sometimes it'll be used uh, on skin instead of stitches because then you won't have the scars from the holes from the stitches. Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> but the the there are a lot of problems with it. So the, it's kind of okay to use externally, but it's toxic still. And so you can't use it internally. I see. And so essentially those, those adhesives are derivatives of super glue more or less. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, no, I mean, that's yeah. cool to hear that. At least it's, it's sort of being used a bit. It's starting to happen. And then obviously as more, you know, better uh, things are found and, and created, we'll, we'll get further along, but that's uh that's cool. It's yeah. exciting to hear this stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. there's also, Oh no, go ahead. Uh, well, I was just wondering, you know, cause when I first heard, you know, bonding things underwater and, and adhesive that works underwater, I was like, you know, what, who are you going to need? What are you going to use that for? It makes sense for the <laughs> medical stuff, of course, but are there any other um, uses where you would want to adhe- adhere stuff underwater? So the other big application <clears throat> that uh, well, there's a lot of applications. Okay. So one 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 is um, repair of marine structures. So if you've got a boat and you you know get a hole in it or something like that, and you need to patch things up to get to port. Uh, there's actually some need for that. The commercially probably the big one there is uh, oil and gas infrastructure. Because there's a lot of oil platforms and stuff at sea. Right. And yeah, yeah. And so there's basically you have a lot of metal structures that are failing. And a lot of these these oil platforms are crazy expensive. Yeah. And, you know, (laughs) crazy billions. And uh, they're coming toward the end of their lifespan. And so they're trying to eke out as much life as they can. But things are are not in good shape. So so basically the the offshore oil and gas industry uh, could benefit from things like this mm-hmm. in in many regards be it the, the 
core structure or actually the the piping and the drilling itself. Uh, and then there's yeah various maritime applications uh, in terms of repairs at sea. There's also so related to adhesives in general uh, are coatings, and so if you think about um, like your car, well maybe. You live in Southern California, I guess. So maybe not your car, but if you if you live somewhere where there's winter, uh, where there's you know hardy people that can withstand snow in winter and stuff like that, right? Um, our, our cars don't last as long because of the road salt, because of rusting, mm-hmm. and it's just you know, a lot of structures rust in general. So if you could make things basically coatings that stick to surfaces and prevent rust, um, there's a zillion applications for that. So one of them is you know, Anything in salt water, so maritime, offshore, you know, oil and gas, shipping, that kind of thing. Yeah. And so where a lot of the current coatings fail is, uh, well, certainly they don't work if you have to apply them to a wet substrate. But even even systems where you can apply them in a dry environment, but then you put them into water, a a lot of uh, materials fail eventually. And so, so, for instance, like, window seals right if the main reason that windows often fail after a while is that the seal stop uh that the seals fail and water gets in and just because they the water resistance isn't very high right right so there it's so some of the applications are for making adhesives or coatings you know applying them in a wet environment so underwater offshore but then they're also applications where you might apply it dry but the intent is to have it in a wet environment and you want it to be able to withstand water and so you know what we're finding is that the ones that can do well applied underwater they also do well just keeping water out in general even if you initially set up a bond dry but then you have your system exposed to water for a long amount of time okay okay i see man well yeah there's so much stuff that i wouldn't even that just happens that I don't even know about, you yeah, know, there's so yeah, many cases. Yeah. yeah. So another example too is, um, <coughs> construction, mm-hmm. right? So if you're at a construction site and it just rained last night, what are you going to do? Not work until it dries out? No, you gotta, you know, you gotta start bonding things together. So, uh, uh you know, so metal into concrete or wood to wood or concrete, concrete, you know, so if you could, do things wet there that would be great but it doesn't doesn't really do too well mm-hmm. um, another another application is cosmetics so do you want to talk about cosmetics a little bit yeah yeah tell me about it okay so so we're two guys so we'll talk about cosmetics right no idea what we're talking <laughs> as we about. do yeah as we do because <laughs> that's just right um so but here too it's a it's sort of a, a wet application so the one <laughs> So in 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 science, when when we have something that we have an application that we think it's like, it's like everybody wants to make that, so we say, oh, that's a sexy application. So like in this area, you'd say, oh, biomedical adhesion, that's the sexy application. But <laughs> I think we can like literally go one step closer to really sexy in terms of cosmetics. So so one thing is uh, nail polish, right? So and I'm sure you're very familiar with nail polish. About <laughs> as familiar as i am um, right so so the, the the current things that that are used you know they don't last as long or they're, they're not as strong or resistant to chips and stuff like that so there's there's a need for higher performance uh materials there but the the one that i find most amusing and i never even knew this was a thing i never even knew this existed until i started getting calls from companies <laughs> is uh do you know anything about fake eyelashes uh, I know they exist, but that's about it. Okay, right. So, <laughs> okay, you, you may find this hard to believe. I find this hard to believe almost. So, so I thought that when there's fake eyelashes, it's like this little strip of adhesive, and they've got these little eyelashy things, and you just tape it onto your eye to your eyelids, right? Right. No, it's way more complicated than that. So what? <clears throat> so what women do? And I don't know. I, they do this for us guys, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> they, <laughs> What they do is they will get what are called eyelash extensions. And so it's it's a little sort of fake eyelash. 
And one by one, the, so you have to go to professional for this, right? So you have to go to technician for this. And what they'll do is they take one of these eyelash extensions and they dip it into a little bit of adhesive and then they glue it on to one of your eyelashes. No. Yeah, I know. I know. I know. So when I <laughs> when I got my first inquiry about this, I thought it was a prank. Right. <laughs> I'm like, no, people don't do that. Like, stop, stop harassing me. But right. Funny enough, funny enough. Like, let's, 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 I got to go. But no, apparently it's real. So, <laughs> so, it, and they do this one by one, one by one. One by one, and and apparently in in some places like like uh, parts of Asia and Eastern Europe and Russia and stuff like that, it's it's a it's a really big thing, and I guess it's on the rise here in the U.S. Um, and I am far from an expert on this. <laughs> I'm just telling you sort of <laughs> things I hear on the street, I guess. Right. <laughs> uh, so, and when they're doing this, right. The, the technicians, they're doing this all with tweezers. So you have these sharp tweezers all manipulating things right by your eye with yeah. glue. <laughs> and they're using super glue. Yeah. So, like, so you can get poked in the eye. You can get your eyes glued shut. Uh, the, <laughs> the, see, what, see what they put up? See what they do for just for us guys? Yeah, Can really. You? Crazy. <laughs> so some people do this all the time, but a lot of people... We'll just do this like for a wedding or a special occasion or something like that. Okay. So, um, and what they're using, it's, it's super glue, just not, I mean, it's the same chemistry as super glue. It's just, I don't think it's branded super glue, but it's so off brand super glue. Mm-hmm. And because it's toxic, sometimes women get really bad reactions to it and their eyes will just blow up. Yeah. And it's toxic. Yikes. Can you believe this? So, obviously, they need an alternative there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And that they have to be desperate if they're calling me for this. <laughs> and and so I I didn't really so now now I can sort of spot this a mile away cuz now now I know that it, it's a thing and it's going on and so like if you look at any photo of of Kim Kardashian or Jennifer Lopez or something like that I look at it I'm like, "Yep, those are fake." <laughs> so I, I, and I and I assure you I'm only looking at the eyelash. <laughs> right, yes. When I when I say those are fake. So <laughs> So, but I can, I can spot it a mile away now because I, because I'm looking for it, but right. I didn't, I didn't know it existed before. And so one day, um, just, just when I'm learning about this, I, I was eating lunch and I'm like, well, okay, let me, let me look, look this up. Let's see. Is this, is this really a thing or whatever? And I, it's, it's very expensive to get this done. Mm-hmm. The, the labor, the labor costs are pretty high, right? Cause it's, it's pretty it takes a while and it's a lot of work. And so I found this, this online beauty forums where women were exchanging experiences like, no, oh, do you like doing it? Do you not? Or, oh, but I like the ritual putting on mascara. Oh, but this would save me from having to do that, whatever. And this is one of these things where I was, I'm reading these <laughs> online beauty forums on my work computer. So right. afterwards, you know, clear history, clear history. <laughs> <laughs> and anyways, this, this, this woman shows photographs of herself before versus after getting the eyelash extensions on and so i look at the before picture i'm like what well, that's a fine looking lady she mm-hmm. looks really good she looks she looks really good right and then i saw the after picture i'm like damn it you know what i think she looks better <laughs> <laughs> oh man that's good yeah so i don't know <laughs> right yeah they, they work that's, i guess yeah, I mean, one of the one of the the issues there is that the uh, um, obviously you want to be able to take showers and stuff afterwards, but the adhesive it, it lets loose after a while. Yeah, <laughs> so they need better water resistance. The other thing is, I guess, I guess once you put these on, you can't use oil based makeup because the oil dissolves the adhesive and takes it off. And most, I guess, most adhe- most uh, makeups oil based, so oh, okay, it's very restrictive in that regard. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, do you know how long that, like, those lashes generally stay on? I think they say about two weeks on the long end. Okay. I don't know. Hmm. I don't, and they start. I don't know what they do. Then they they like start falling out. Yeah. I, but then like half of them are out, half of them are on. So I don't know what they do at that point. Do you like yank yank them all out or? Oh gosh. Or it's like drugs. You got to like keep going back. Like, like, you got to keep going back and keep going back. And right. Keep going. The, the other oh and actually speaking of drugs so it's not really literally drug but <laughs> drug like activity so if you get if you put on um, fake 
nails, we're talking about eyelashes, but if you go to fake nails, right, you got to glue those things on. And there too, um, women use an adhesive that is also essentially super glue and it's toxic. And so if you just do it once in a while for, you know, a friend's wedding, I guess it's probably okay. But there are some people that like to have fake nails all the time and you eventually build up uh, a toxic response to the adhesive. Mm -hmm. And one of the ways that manifests itself is that your fingers get all red and, and stuff. And, but then also the nail, the act, the, the real nail, not the fake one Uh starts to deform. And so then you're, you can't take off the fake nails because now your natural nails look even worse than they did before. Uh, So then they have to go back. That gives them more incentive to put on more fake nails, but then that also means more toxic glue. So it's like drugs. You just gotta keep going back and keep going back and you can't get out of it. Yeah. Oh man, that's rough. (laughs) So yeah, I mean, I shouldn't be laughing. I guess it's a problem, but uh, at some level it's... Yeah. Anyway, so so those are those are like cosmetic applications, biomedical applications. There, there's a lot of uh, other places where we need new adhesives because basically most of the the adhesives we have are toxic. So that one of the things we've been thinking about a lot lately is uh, plywood and fiberboard and chipboard and uh, oriented strand board and things like that. So if if you have plywood, it's you know, pieces of wood, but it's held together with an adhesive. Uh, And that adhesive, there's sort of three main flavors of it, I guess you'd say. But the one consistent component in the malt is formaldehyde. Oof. Uh, Yeah, and it's toxic, and it's a gas, and uh, it's colorless and odorless and stuff like that. So, but, but basically when you have fresh plywood so if you build a new house or you go into a new building or something like that. the first year or two it's off gassing a carcinogen oh man yeah so so you're breathing a carcinogen for a while and this is an issue but there's not um a lot of alternatives available right now so we've been thinking about that a bit yeah um oh it's also an issue with furniture mm. right so if you go into a big furniture store you're probably breathing a bunch of that Yikes. not to mention if you bring it home yeah yeah because 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 sort of lower end furniture is made with chipboard fiberboard plywood that kind of thing right uh so yeah there's there are issues with the toxins coming out of the adhesives there um i mentioned packaging that's another place where we're thinking about trying to sort of make some improvements there because uh, cardboard is a, you know, there's tons and tons of cardboard around that kind of can be recycled, but the recyclers complain a lot about it because if you think about a cardboard box, like a corrugated cardboard box, it's, it's essentially two thin sheets of the cardboard. Then it's got the, you know, the wavy part that's in between. Right. Yeah. That wavy part is glued to the two flat parts. Okay. Yeah. And that glue, uh, is usually not always, but it's usually petroleum based and it gums up the works of the recycling system. Oh. But but also what that means is the box you can't compost anything. Oh right, yeah. Right? The majority of it could be, but except for you got this this bad thing. So one of the things we're working on now is making bio based degradable adhesives as alternatives for that. Um food packaging, so so one of the adhesive systems we have, we've got a protein and we've got some some of this adhesion chemistry. We, it's a protein we're taking from corn and, and the adhesion molecules, as you could call them, we're taking from other natural systems. So trees, and nuts and fruits, and various things you can get. And if we, could com- if we combine them just right, we can make adhesives that are really strong, like super glue strong, and also... Uh, bio-based and degradable and so maybe that could be good for uh packaging green packaging but also uh packaging for things that are in contact with food because if you think about your i don't know box of organic crackers or whatever right that they're in it in the packaging it's sealed up with a petroleum-based adhesive and there's things that can leach yeah. out of that. 
Oh my gosh! Wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's everywhere. Right? Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah, right? the the non toxicity part of it seems like that could be just so great for everything. Yeah, yeah. I, I I hope so. I would think. Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. Totally. Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah. yeah, and and other environmental things, right? So like electronics, you know, phones, laptops, and stuff like that. You don't really. They're not easy to recycle because there's glue holding things together and you can't really get it apart to take out the, you know, precious metals and gold and things like that in there. So oh. if you could make adhesives that stick when you want them to stick strongly, but then can come apart when you want them to, <clears throat> maybe, maybe we could then recycle things because there's a lot of things that you just landfill. So electronics are sometimes, you know, often landfilled despite maybe what we hear. And then, um, one of the one of the main components of landfills these days is phone books, which are not a growth industry. I understand, but um, the paper is recyclable, but sort of like the cardboard box. But the the glue that holds the the binding that's not right. So the whole thing goes in, or like sh- your old shoes, or the interior of cars, or a lot of furniture, or anything that's made out of you know plywood or chipboard or anything like that. <sighs> it all just gets landfilled. Yeah. So. Jeez, man. Yeah. It's everywhere. Yeah. 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 <laughs> no, it's crazy. Like this, and it just is the stuff you're doing is so important. You know, it's, we really need to get this stuff going. So I'm glad, you know, glad you're working on it. I, yeah. I think, I mean, I, it keeps me going. I see a lot of potential impacts here. So hopefully, yeah. hopefully we can, we can solve some of these problems and stuff we're trying. Totally. Do what we can. <laughs> so you mentioned the like, um, uh, eyelash companies that came to you and were, were asking for <laughs> yeah. this stuff. Do you have yeah. like, I mean, how does that work with, do you have a lot of companies coming to you for like their specific use cases and asking you to develop stuff for them? Yeah, I get, I get inquiries from companies, I guess, fairly frequently. Um, usually, usually if they're calling me they're like I said before, they're usually pretty desperate. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, so uh, they, often have a problem to solve and we're not, you know, I have, I have bills to pay here to keep the lab going. So I'm not able to just drop what we're working on to help a company. Right. Um, obviously if they're going to fund the lab, that's a totally different story. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I mean, we, we talked to companies, we're, we're starting a company now that's taking one of our adhesive systems, hopefully to market for some applications, oh, but cool. we have several other adhesive systems that we have not, commercialized and we we don't have any industrial partners yet so yeah we're we're definitely open to um taking things to the market um you know it's sort of a typical valley of death kind of thing like we have what might look like a promising technology and many companies will have many different applications but you know we haven't yet proven that our material works for a given very specific situation. Mm-hmm. And so then there's a gap. And so, so the, the, the challenge is always finding a way to bridge that gap to then get something uh, to market. Right. So if you say, Oh, well, I need a new eyelash glue or, Oh, I need a new bone cement or, Oh, I need a new, you know, thing for packaging. It's all, you, you could end up with the start, the, the first initial thing, but who's, who's going to do the work to, to really, test it and get it to that final product. And, you know, some of that could be done here. Some of that could be done in the company, or maybe we should start some more companies to do it. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, I hope, hopefully, hopefully we'll get several of these things to market in, in several different contexts. Um, it's kind of exciting actually that we have materials that you, you can very easily draw an arrow from, from a given material we have to several different applications and markets. Yeah. Uh, yeah, man, that's so cool. And so do you, uh, I guess, is this stuff patentable or like, how do you kind yeah, of go? Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. 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 So each one of the, each, every time we develop a new system, we file a, a patent on it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Man. Awesome. Yeah. There's so many things it's, yeah. And then I can see how that's just a whole nother can of worms to go to the commercial side and prove it and, and yeah. get, Yeah. yeah. Yeah, we're spending more of our time now on that than we used to. So we used to be more in the fundamental, let's just understand how the sea creatures do what they do mode. Mm-hmm. And then we then we added in to that the, 
let's make some new materials. And then, then from there, like, oh, let's test them under a few circumstances that might have some commercial impact. Um, so we're getting closer to the commercial side of things, but there's still sort of a lot of work to be done there. But um, it's something I definitely hope that we can have as more of our future here. Yeah, because yeah. yeah, like like you say, I can see it so many different ways. And in fact, actually, in in some regards, one of the difficult one of the difficulties is trying to figure out what commercial applications to pursue. Mm-hmm. So right. what we're finding in, in in some of the company people I've talked to, we said, all right, well, look here, let's let's look at these five applications and let's let's explore them in more detail and figure out which are the ones we you know let's and we'll you know we'll start with five or six or whatever and we'll pick one or two to focus on. And what you end up doing is as you research a given application for a given adhesive, new adhesive. And you start talking to people because you're trying to narrow it down. So you're trying to narrow it down and say, okay, let's pick one thing to commercialize or one market to go after right. or two. Um, then you start talking to people to get advice, you know, people in the industry or other industries are related. And they're like, oh, you have that? Oh, well, here's three things, three other things you got to work on. <laughs> so so when, you, when you start with like five to narrow it down to one and, and you, you end up with 15 instead of <laughs> one. So, so it's a good problem to have, right? <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. Man. So, and then I, well, how long have you been, has your lab been going? How long have you been working on this stuff? I'm, I'm hitting 20 years now. 20 years. Nice. Yeah. Oh, I just pain a, a little pain in my back. Cause I said, <laughs> shoots up the spine. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. No, I've, yeah. I've been doing this for 20 years. It's an, like, since I got my own lab here at Purdue. Yeah. 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 So uh, how does, I mean, if you're, I don't know if you're even allowed to talk the, about this, but how does that work with, um, working at Purdue, do they like fund you and then, you know, own part of this stuff or how does that all work? Yeah. So, so Purdue's a large research university. So the way it works here is pretty typical of how it would work at most large research universities in the United States. So basically um, they give me the lab, but they, I have to go outside to get the money to bring in, to run the lab. Uh-huh. So mo- yeah. So I, I'm sort of a revenue stream for the university. <laughs> um, I also teach. We're all you know, talking about research, but of course I teach as well. Mm-hmm. Um, the Almost all the money that I get to run the lab has to come from the federal funding agency. So National Science Foundation or National Institutes of Health, or in our case, um, the Office of Naval Research has been really good about funding our lab. Oh, cool. Uh, yeah, yeah. So that's, that's the biggest sort of stressor is trying to find money because as you probably know, funding for research is not not exactly plentiful these days Mm -hmm. um from the federal government you can also get industrial support for for research that's i find that to be a little bit trickier to get but anyway so so we get hopefully we we can continue to get funding externally for to run our lab and then uh we develop new technologies and the university and I and the students who develop the technologies in our lab, we all sort of have ownership to it. I guess, I guess officially and technically the university owns everything, but if money actually starts changing hands, we get part of it as inventors. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, yeah. And that, so the university pays for the uh, for the patenting. Mm-hmm. And then, and they've been giving us a lab and the infrastructure here and stuff like that. So then they get big chunks of any money that would come in. Uh, but they also provide some support in, in getting all things to happen. So if, a, so if a company says, Hey, I like that. I want to, you know, license it to our company or in a product or something, or, or I want to sell it as a product, then the university has a tech transfer office that um, facilitates all of that. Oh, okay. So, I see. They, yeah. they help yeah. you out and you help. Okay. Yes. No, yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Makes sense. So, so it's good. It's a good, it's a good setup. I don't know. I think, I think Purdue might be better than the average place in this regard these days, but it's, it's mm-hmm. pretty straightforward and, and work generally works out really well. Good. Cool. Yeah. I was just curious how that all worked. Yeah. 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 Man, dude, John, this is awesome. We've been going for like <laughs> an hour and 20 minutes. This is crazy. Yeah. I was like, you got to cut this down to like three. No one's going to listen to this. For this long. <laughs> no, it's so interesting. Once you really get into it, I love it. I was like, man, well, maybe we'll do half hour or something, but this, there's so much good stuff here. It's so fun. Well, good. Good. All right. I'm glad you think so. Cause yeah, I, I, 
I definitely think so. Yeah, love it. Um, so I guess can we? Is there anywhere people can go or anything they can do to learn more about this and more about what you're doing? Uh, let's see. So yeah, I, I'm not the biggest social media guy, but we we have a uh, we have a lab website. So if you, if you just Google my name, Jonathan Wilker, and Purdue, it's P U R D U E. You'll probably find stuff. Um, we have a talk that it's on TED.com that came up this year. Uh, that's a sort of a video overview of mm-hmm. what we do. So if you just type my name into the TED search box, or pr- probably probably comes up on Google, I would imagine. Um, we have started a lab Twitter feed a little while ago. Oh shoot! <laughs> I, don't have, I don't even know what's. I think it's Wilker Lab Purdue. I think is what it is. Okay. <laughs> I'm obviously not a big Twitter guy. <laughs> I'm, about to, I'm about to look it up right now. It's okay. uh, yeah, it's at Wilker Lab Purdue. Yeah, that's what it is. Okay. <laughs> they have like two followers, and I think they're both my mom. <laughs> <laughs> well, both different accounts. Yeah, maybe we'll get it up to four now. <laughs> yeah, right. Oh, excellent, excellent. <laughs> uh, perfect. No, I'll, I'll throw um, links to the, your to your website, the uh, Twitter, and that TED Talk too. That's really good to check out. Super. Excellent. So people can check that all stuff out. So sweet, Jonathan. I mean, is there, so just kind of wrapping it up, I guess, is there, do you have like a, a main, you know, overarching goal or achievement you want to hit with all this? Yeah, I, I just, we kind of want to understand how nature makes materials and then, then we want to transition that knowledge into making products that could, you know, impact the marketplace and you know make the world a better place you know like biomedical adhesives or less tox less toxins in the materials all around us i mean wouldn't wouldn't that be cool that would be awesome that would be awesome yeah that yeah. would be awesome so yeah yeah that's, that's kind of that's all i want <laughs> <laughs> that and world peace yes right <laughs> <laughs> no sweet i love it cool man well yeah i mean just Hearing this stuff, it's so interesting how you're kind of started it all and then hearing all the applications too. It's pretty exciting. So really, really cool. glad to meet you and hear about all this stuff. So so thanks, John. I appreciate it. Thanks thanks so much for having having me on. I, I appreciate that and um nice to nice to chat with you and, and I appreciate the, the interest. Yeah, cool. Of course. Cool. Well I mean, enjoy your weekend and uh good luck. Have a good one, right? You too. Thanks. Take care. All right, you too. Bye. Yeah, bye. See, I told you it was interesting, right? You liked it. Jonathan is awesome. Thank you for being on the show, Jonathan. Learned a lot. Hope you did too. And, uh, you know, if you guys like this episode, I just want to ask you to share it uh, with your friends or family. Word of mouth is great. You can share it on social media if you're so inclined to share it with all your uh, virtual friends. Uh, that super helps out the show and um, gets us more exposure. Exposure. So I really help. I really appreciate any uh, help and and stuff like that. So uh, we're on Instagram, uh, Curiosityness Podcast on there. I'm on Facebook, Curiosityness. I'm on uh, Twitter. I'm on a website. I'm on the interweb. So, uh, yeah, that's it. And, you know, if you have any feedback or or uh, want to share anything, send me an email, Travis at curiosityness dot com or, or send me, a, you know, give me a comment or something on uh, social media. Again, if you want to share the stuff, just tag me on social media. I'll pick it up. I'll thank you publicly and everything. So that really helps us out. Uh, but that's it. Thanks again to Jonathan. And thank you to being Thank you to you for being here at the end and listening all the way through this and uh, supporting. So thanks. Goodbye.